Okay, let's move to our next presentation by Umang Patnagar, who is the Senior Vice President, Strategic Sourcing and Supply Chain Management with SRF Limited. Umang has more than 20 years of experience in the roles of production planning, control, strategic planning, and sales. He is currently responsible for strategic sourcing and supply chain planning for specialty chemical business. Can we welcome Umang with a big round of applause, please? Good morning. So we'll be talking a little bit about risk in a bit more detail. Uh, I'll pick up from what Harsh has already talked about. Uh, Rahul has also talked about. I think risk is something which we do as a part of our everyday lives. And uh, so to that extent, a lot of what I may share is going to be stuff which you would already know, we would already know, we would already be familiar with. Possibly we'll pick up something new and interesting. And uh, the purpose or what I would like to talk about for the most part is going to be more on the what. Right? We're not so much general, but more specifically about how uh, we may be implementing risk management, risk mitigation practices, and how maybe uh, we could uh, do that as, uh, as well. Okay, a little bit of theory, we'll touch a few minutes of context. Um, I'll walk on Rahul's footsteps in this one. Uh, risk identification and mitigation, technology and risk. How can we do different types of technology and to what extent they can help us uh, doing our jobs better. And uh, business processes. And really that's something which I feel is something which most of us, many of us may not take as seriously as it should be in terms of risk management. Very, very simple definition. The possibility of something bad happening, right? And we'll touch the possibility part in a little bit more detail when we're talking about the technology aspect of risk, but something bad or it's raining on the way, way to work tomorrow or raining in the afternoon today, which is what the forecast used to say. Right? And supposing you have a scale of 1 to 10, and you're talking about rain, and it could be something like that, you know, a few minutes, five minutes shower on the way, or it could be a little bit heavier than that, or you could have that happen to us, right? And obviously when we talk about purchase risk, we're talking about the full gamut. You would have stuff getting late by one week, and then you have inventory, and you have space in your production line, you've got finished goods inventory, so, I mean, getting it delayed by a week doesn't really make too much of a difference. Or it could be a little bit more severe, or you could have the last happen to you. And, you know, with the best efforts and skills and mitigation in place, you would still uh, have an impact on your ability to get to work if the third was to happen. Or you have a vehicle breakdown. And I'll come why we are talking about or differentiating between the first and the second, right? What is the difference between rain on the way to work and a tire puncture on the way to work, for example, or a combination of the two, which is right, you get more and more interesting as we go along. But if you look at these two risks which we talked about, this is just one type of risk. This is a type of risk which is late. But there are other ways or other class types of risk which could happen to you. You could fall ill and never get to work. So that's a different type of risk which is there in this case. Or there could be you party till late last evening and you, when you get to work tomorrow, you're there but nothing much is happening. <laughs> so, so that's a different type of risk, right? You're there, the material is there, but uh, you're not really able to deliver on this job. So that's another type of risk. And there are so many other types of risks which are there. So we are familiar with this, which is what we've been talking about. Domestic road, site shutdown, port congestion, international shipping, ship delays, lockdown, booking getting rolled over, airline cancellation, bunch of delays. And these are really what we talk about when we talk about operational challenges or risks in everyday business or which is the stuff for which you know the organization would immediately get an impact or what we've been talking about for the most part when we talk about COVID delays and issues and risks in the last couple of years for us. But this is all one type of risk. This is all availability risk. Material not being there in the factory at the time it is required for production. All of this rolls into one. But what about price? And you know, we think of them as separate risks, but all of us know, when the first happens, it results in the second. I don't get contracted products because there's a ship from China or elsewhere which is late. I go and buy domestically from a trader at 3x the price. Because cost of plant downtime is much higher than the cost of paying three times for one item on your bill of materials. You've got a raw material price movement, you've got contract renegotiation, you've got freight cost hikes, you've got utility cost hikes, you've got sourcing mix variants where your allocations are not what you had thought they would be. And these are all different ways of price risk, which hits all of us in different ways. And these are risks which transform from one unit to the other. 
right? If you don't manage your availability risk well, you get hit with price risk and vice versa. Somebody buys lowest cost 100%, right? He is taking price risk, but he may not think of it like that and that translates into availability risk. That supplier may not give him material when the chips are down. You sold it to you for 100 bucks and you are getting 140 in the market, you will sell it at 140 and he will tell you, Meri factory ban de sir. And I'm sure we would all have experiences of that nature, right? And they've got so much stuff, documents not received, raw material quality rejection on receipt, import officer falls in, so the processing does not get happened at time, customer query at, customs is asking you a query at care. And I mean, I'm just saying that there are so many things which are outside these two buckets which we have touched about in more detail, right? So having talked about what does risk at the higher level mean to all of us, so that we're all on the same page, that you've got types of risks, and then within each type of risk or a mode of risk, if I were to start talking the jargon a little bit, uh, there would be very specific reasons for that mode of risk to affect you, your business. So how do you quantify it? And now I'm going into the, the specific technologies. And I'm going to be talking, I mean, SRF is a TQM company, so we use TQM practices. So I will be talking in the TQM frame of reference. But surely there are equivalent practices in Six Sigma, there are equivalent practices in so many different schools or principles of thought. So this is not the only way you choose things as cat. But I thought rather than just talking about it at a global level, let's talk about a specific way in which you can actually do something about it. So first is you list out your risks. What would be a problem for you? And we've listed out a bunch of problems which you could have. Then you identify your likelihood, your severity, and your detectability. Many principles or schools of thought only talk about the first two. They talk about likelihood and they talk about severity. They don't talk about ability to detect in time. And this is the difference between rain tomorrow or rain later in the week and having a tire puncture. Rain tomorrow or rain later in the week is forecastable. You can have a reasonably good idea it's going to rain. You can take your raincoat, you can take your umbrella, you can leave earlier in the day. You can do something about it because you know it is going to happen. And that brings down the likelihood. Even if the event happens, the severity will come, become negligible. You can avoid it to the most part. But tire puncture tomorrow you can't detect. Nobody can tell you you will have a tire puncture tomorrow. So the detectability comes down. And therefore the risk, the, the impact of the risk goes up. Right? So you've got your likelihood, you've got a severity, you've got a detectability. And that gives you a score on 0 to 1000. On whatever you identify. Now practically you'll never have a 0. You'll ignore those stuff. But you'll be talking about stuff which would fall on the structure and uh, so you list down your risks. So first you list down your types or modes of risk, stuff not turning up, price, quality, rejections, whatever else you may have. Then for each type, if it's late it could be because of A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, whatever. So we've won this. Now let's talk about mitigation and this is very often, so this is an example which I've taken. Right? So you heavy rain or tire puncture and this is what the matrix may look like. Uh, so you, uh, obviously this is a very small list but uh, you, I mean if you bring 2000 raw materials and for each raw material you have a bunch of items which could happen. Right? So even if you pick up the critical raw materials as you were suggesting, Rahul was suggesting earlier today or as Harsh had mentioned and then within each of them you do your mitigation matrix. Uh, each of your buyers has enough work to do on his raw materials to identify what are your concerns over here. <coughs> okay. You've got, so you've identified your risk of concern. And this is the critical part which we often miss. I mean, that's at least my experience. You've got a list. It says these are types of risk. These are the higher risk raw materials you've got so far and we'll be very happy. We have done our work. We have identified our risk. But what about mitigation? In this case, I were to say, like, if you were to talk about this business of tire puncture, then you would, what can you say? If a tire puncture means a delay of 15 minutes, if a toolkit is available and if you know how to change a tire, then it's important for you to make sure that toolkit is there in the vehicle. It's important for you to have practiced how to change a tire so that you know you can do it if you got into trouble. And you need to leave 15 minutes early. If you do A plus B plus C, this tire puncture is now meaningless for you. Where is this risk has been successfully mitigated. But you need to do A plus B plus C. If you don't do A, then even if you know how to change a tire and you leave early, you will still get stuck because that equipment is not available to you. Therefore, in our business, in our daily operations, it's very important for us to have thought through how will we successfully mitigate. And then we, another of the logical flaws which we often commit is that we don't link up the action taken to the risk. 
is it a successful mitigation of that risk? I leave 30 minutes early, but I don't check that the toolkit is there. The tire puncture will not, 30 minutes will not solve the problem. You will be standing with the roadside for 30 minutes. We have to think through that the mitigation being taken is successfully going to address that specific type of risk. And then if we do that, then we are able to mitigate that class of risk. And that brings us to the ability to review your matrix to bring down your severity. Because even if you have a tire puncture, the severity or impact if that is 1 and no longer an 8 on your matrix and that risk will then fall down the ladder. And you take up your next one and you do the same exercise to it and that is how the cookie crumbles. Okay. So once you have built your long list, you build a risk assessment matrix, you have got a likelihood and you have got a severity. Obviously, detectability is built into that and then you have got, I mean if it is green, you do not do anything about it. If it is yellow, you need to keep a track on it but you do not do too much more to it. Uh, if it is red, you need to start de-risking it and really if it is extreme, you are saying that my likelihood is also very high and the implications are also very, very high and really I have not done anything about it till now, uh, then it is already too late. This is like the guy I ran across at the P3 airport who is saying my flight, he is standing outside and he is saying my flight is leaving 30 minutes. I said you can go home dude, <laughs> this is not going to happen now. <laughs> that flight has gone, <laughs> you are a dead man walking. <laughs> So really the whole goal is to avoid getting into extreme territory, is to try and stay within moderate, is try to work actively on the highs and uh, just, I mean obviously there is some element of faith and prayer and good luck which comes into it because I mean nobody knows what is going to happen tomorrow. Okay, there was one point which you want to talk about which is how vendor selection affects risk and I am just taking a very simple extreme kind of a situation, right. You have got a domestic source, delivery risk is low, pricing risk may be high. I mean depending on the nature of you like buying spot from a trader then anything can happen on pricing. And if you are doing an import source your delivery risk is higher because you have got ships and you have got logistics in uh, the foreign country, you have got logistics in India, you have got port congestion, you have got customs, you have got uh, lots of action happening. Uh, but pricing risk may be lower because obviously the material is shipping 30 to 60 days in advance, you know already it is on the high seas, you would have contracts in place, you would have international trade in place, you may have LCs or some other means. And all of that are different ways in which your supply is getting more and more secured in a way. So yeah, so vendor selection would affect risk. But this is not sufficient in terms of detailing to be able to take a decision, right. Is a supplier reliable? Even an international supplier may not be reliable. I mean, even a domestic supplier may be reliable. So thinking about it only as domestic and international is not sufficient deep. If a domestic source goes down, what happens to your factory? And this is something which is, you know, I mean, I have been struggling with it. I do not have an answer yet. Domestic and international sources are not equivalent. If I am buying regularly from an international source and it gets delayed, I know today that 60 days from today my factory is stock out. So I have 60 days to buy from a domestic source. Given that most domestic sourcing happens in 30 day windows, this is not a problem. I can pay a premium for that event and I can manage. But if I was to flip this, if I am buying primarily from a domestic source and if this domestic source I cannot supply to you. And they happen to do this like you know next week I cannot supply to you is really what happens. Nobody tells you that even 30 days earlier that I cannot. At that time you can't start importing, there is no time. So, <coughs> sorry. so a domestic purchase, if you are doing domestic purchase your inventory is one trend or multiple sources is a second trend. How you can solve or reduce your risk on that account. Uh, if you are doing import sources and a domestic source is, is how you can obviously de-risk your situation. Right. The whole effort is, I mean, in in my experience, the way I mean, I mean, chemicals, right? So obviously, which may uh, different industries work differently, uh, but at least in chemicals, it's all about knowing in advance, because I don't have very many suppliers. In a number of cases, I may be buying 40% of global supply. Not that I'm buying so much quantity. It's just that the supply is quite limited. There are only two or three people on the whole planet who make those chemicals. That's the nature of specialty chemicals. So if that guy is going to go down, if he has a planned downtime or I assume he is going to go down for 30 days, 60 days. So this is about service level. I have not touched it but service level is something when you are de-risking you have to take a target on how much are you de-risking. I can manage a downtime of 30 days, of 60 days, of 90 days, of 180 days. What is your service level? What is your target? Nothing is infinite. There is a cost for everything. If I am taking inventory as a solution for how long? So that is something which the procurement function has to agree with the CEO. What is the level of risk you want me to manage? It can't be open ended or infinite because I, then my cost becomes infinite. So that is not something which you are going to sign off on. 
So anyway, there are lots of contract versus spot and lots of people, commodity purchasing may be different, specialty purchasing may work differently, um, Nestle may look at it very differently. So yeah, uh, strategic suppliers versus lowest cost suppliers, and there is its own pluses and minuses. Do you want to pay a premium continuously and get supply uh, even when the chips are down or uh, you can manage. So I mean, it's not just about you, it's about the supplier. Many suppliers trust or they kind of honor contracts and many suppliers don't. And my wishing it will not change that. Okay, let me run through these. So uh, technology, user, business process and technology. This is the triangle which we look at. Uh, business processes are how organizations minimize risk in operation. So of course we've talked a lot about having technology which will do things for you. But until the business process is in place, the technology will not get used or it will not be able to be used or to get the value which you are expecting from it. Uh, you've got lots of things which you've talked about. I think I'm not the right person. People have talked about this in a lot more detail. Uh, flexibility or analytics or collaboration, access anywhere. And I'm, I'm sure we are all using these in our systems, but this is where technology can play a role. And uh, AI in analytics is where the probability part, you can do something about it. One is that you've got some data on which supplier is able to deliver on time. And one is that you can ask AI to build some structures, but you have to give it the data. And right now, I don't know if in procurement, we have enough data in the structured in the right way for AI tools to run on it. We're running it successfully in IIoT in manufacturing, but we don't have the data required to run it in procurement, at least right now. I'm sure maybe some of you are much more ahead of the curve. We are not there. So you estimate likelihood, you quantify severity, you improve detectability. And uh, if the tech helps you do any A, B or C, then the tech is useful for you for risk. I'm again, my talk or my focus is only on risk. If the technology helps you do A, B or C, it is useful for you. If it, do, it doesn't do any of this, for de-risking at least it is not relevant. It may help you improve productivity, it may do lots of other things for you, but it will not help you do this. And obviously, so we've talked about establishing the context, identifying risk, analyzing risk, evaluating risk, treating risk, right? We've talked about how you would do any any of all of these. You would talk about monitor and review. So monitor and review is where the business process comes in. Do you want to review it every three months, every six months, every 12 months? Which are the raw materials we want to review? Can you do all of them? It's practically impossible. But which are the relevant ones? Because the problem is that salt doesn't appear on the plant in time, your reaction stops. So the, there's no issue on criticality. Everything is critical. But you can't put the same effort into everything. So how do you differentiate? And then you've got these questions. Who should do it? Are all raw materials equally important? How do you know if your mitigation is successful or effective? This is my last slide. Institutional risk maturity. You evaluate for yourself at this time. You have one extreme where you don't do anything. You say, Iska to koi kuch nahi kar sakta. Badi badi company ke bhi plant ho jate hain ji. Right? So that's one extreme. You don't see a need to do anything about it. The other extreme is that you know you're taking risks deliberately. You know the, the trade-off between availability and price, and you're saying for this price, I'm willing to take this risk because I've got ABC mitigation basic solutions in place. So risk management is you. So you know exactly what is the risk of downtime, what is the risk of time, and you're willing to take a chance or not willing to take a chance based on an evaluation of the risk, based on a quantified basis. So and obviously you've got a range in between. Thank you. This is what we would like it to look like, you know. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, one quick question for us. Yes. Someone thanks for the presentation. My name is Vishal. Uh, I think whatever you said absolutely makes the most sense from a manufacturing sector and a direct source. Now let's take a step back at the indirect sourcing the services. So business continuity is important, but I think more than that, it is more about the operational, not the operational risk, I would say reputational risk with the services se sector goes to, right? And which, is, which should be actually covered at the onboarding stage of a supplier more than like ongoing monitoring of a particular supplier. So how do you actually ensure from a services standpoint that the onboarding risk is maintained? Like I'm not sure like how you do it in your organization, but that's what I'm trying to do in my organization. So right, very much interested in understanding that how the established organizations like SRF, Nestle, they're doing it at an onboarding standpoint from an indirect uh, spent perspectives. Sir, I think you put it into two pieces. One is that when you're looking at service providers, they come with their own reputation. And that obviously takes into the evaluation. When you do an evaluation or selection of a, of a source of this nature, uh, obviously you look at what the cost, you look at what the benefit is, then you look at the reputation. We'll do that. I mean, I think that's what all of us, I mean, you would need to do something like that. 
because you can do this before you choose a partner. Once you choose a partner, you have him, what's and all. Right? You can't say ki banda to ye hai, cost ye hai, lekin reputation to iski jo hai to hai, lekin reliability zada ho gi. Nahi ho gi. It is what it is. Right? You can have systems or processes in place to evaluate that whatever he has committed to you, he is delivering to you. That you can do. You can find out if there is a, is a, a what, what, walk, what he is talking and what he is doing, if there is that gap is there. That you can identify. But the primary reason why we have not gone into that aspect is because the implication of that risk is not immediate. If you have got a situation that an auditor is kind of frying you because uh, you made some gaps and you know, it is now in the newspaper, at that time it is not a risk anymore, it is already happened. And But if you are not at that point, you are looking at a gap between what he is saying and what he is doing and to that extent you can take a choice, it is your choice whether you want to continue with him or you want to change him. But it is not an immediate, for, I mean for us in manufacturing, uh, the rubber hits the road very, very quickly. <laughs> So I mean, I, but I, I mean, I don't have an answer for you, sir. So I think uh, we have to struggle with that. Yes. I was just trying to understand how you build your organizations because. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So yeah, in Nestle, for indirects, what we do is like uh, number one, you have to do a financial risk analysis, right? So because so companies who are giving services often may be little low on cash, and so a financial analysis, and in that you also can check the background of the promoters or the directors who are there. Uh, if there are companies like if you're taking warehousing services or something of that sort, maybe a legal uh, review may also help that the warehouse he's offering, whether even he has title to it or not, right? And uh, of course, uh, if it revo if, uh, involves labor involvement, then uh, maybe something like Ecovadis or SEDEX certifications can be made either mandatory or you can make them sign that after the first PO, six months, 12 months, you would go and uh, get this. So when you put these questions, uh, you know, you would really see uh, if, the, if the party is uh, sound, then they would be willing to cooperate with you, else you, you can sell it at. So are there any manual processes in your organization for that? Or it's like a purely manual process? So it's kind of like I said, uh, either you can use, see it's manual and uh, technology enabled both. So you can put these conditions as preconditions in your Arriva events and people who accept it, then you have a documentation that they accepted it. And otherwise, uh, uh, no, there is no pure automatic solution for it. No, there, there are companies nowadays who are actually giving you the complete risk, ass risk assessment. Like for example, I remember one signal X. Okay. And then there is one which is Rubix. These companies, they are actually fetching data from Dun & Bradstreet, D&D, and their own survey. So they give you entire profile, financial profile of the sub supplier. They also give, if there are any cases they are uh, having uh, in different, different courts across India, even GST default also. So supposedly, if there is a GST default, they highlight that. Their return performance, even return performance is also you can see. And they give the scorecard also. So all in all, this is one way of actually checking it. And it's available online. Of course, you have to pay for it. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, please stay back. Please stay back for a few seconds. Can I request Kapil to let me on stage to hand over this amazing piece? Thank you so much.